All right. Well, hello, everyone. This is the weekly meeting of the Open Network Security Monitoring Group at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Let's get started. We'll move right into the meeting notes here. So, group updates. A few things. We have um, three sponsors now. Uh, Doug Burks of Security Onion Solutions uh, is now a, t a Tier 1 sponsor, he did a very gracious donation. So if you are interested in Security Onion and uh, commercial support for that uh, NSM-based Linux distribution, please check out Security Onion Solutions. Uh, Doug also provides Security Onion training, and there's going to be another one coming up. The, I think the actual close uh, or for that one is Thursday. So do check out their website, and if you're interested, do book a, um, a visit to that. Second up, we have a Tier 2 sponsor from Chris Sanders. Uh, he, has, he runs the Rural Technology Fund, and he also has written a, a really good uh, network security monitoring book called uh, Applied Network Security Monitoring, which we talked about in the past. So um, do support his Rural Technology Fund, which helps to allocate money for people that are interested in technology and in rural areas. And finally, we have a Tier 3 sponsor uh, from Ryan Stillians of Vigilant Technology Solutions. Vigilant is a company that does managed NSM solutions for small businesses. So if you'd like to have your logs monitored, events, and all that stuff handled by someone else because your staff, you don't have staff to support it, do check out Vigilant. That's what they specialize in. Also, we have a GoFund meeting, or excuse me, we have a GoFundMe campaign that uh, each of these contributed to. So if you would like to have your own, uh, if you'd like to donate to the group to help sponsor us, uh, whether it's an individual donation or as a corporation, do check that out and go to GoFundMe.com slash OpenNSM. Next up, we're going to go into the meeting sections for the, the news items. So let's scroll down here. And one item we have up today is this tool called Massive. It's a static uh, code analyzer for malware. And it's uh, written by the guys at CoreLogic, and they just came out with a web user interface for it. So um, you can check it out here. We'll quickly open it up to, as a brief demo. So you can see there's a few samples up here we can, we can take a look at. So um, they're, they're different from the last time, but so people are using this. Uh, let's try independence.exe. And we, from here, we can see a number of uh, things we can click on to further drill down. Let's take a look at the, the portable executable info, because this is a uh, Windows binary. And you can see, we can see the various sections of the binary, such as the text section. Also, um, the imports. So this is the import table that is present in uh, Windows binaries that actually are used to say, hey, we need to rely on a particularly dynamic linkable library, DLLs in the case of Windows, let's load that. So we can actually drill from that. Also, it actually gives you strings and a bunch of other things so you can actually take a look at there and see if there's anything interesting that stands out in plain text and uh, that may be of use to figure out what this particular program or this particular binary tries to accomplish. Next up we have uh, Snort++, which is the name for the new rewrite of Snort, which is currently in uh, alpha still, I believe. So Snort add, adds, the new version actually adds uh, these inspection events. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to go to a more event-based um, setup where you can actually, you know, you have, you have your package, you have your decode, you have your preprocessors, and then you have various actions after that. Well, with the new, with this new uh, setup, we actually break it down. You can see that you can apply various things during particular por portions of this flow for the packets through the preprocess, et cetera. And the result is it gives you something a little bit like Bro, in that you can see this example that gives you at the bottom. You can use a key, HTTP underscore raw underscore URI, and that will attach a particular, that will actually generate an event, and then you put it in the data log variable. And what actually ends up happening is that is assigned as a logging stream. So then you can actually, in this way, generate our log of various URIs. So this is simply a, a URI logger. So this is a new feature. Um, and their design is going to make it much easier to actually 
uh, build plugins and additions and uh, you know help um, bring out the capabilities of uh, snort more with this new this new design and one second here we'll close the door all right so in the next section um, we have there was a commit to open BSD uh, that, a, that a developer made that adds uh, message authentication codes to ping. So in the payload, which is really interesting, um, you never, it's one of those things you never really think about, and it kind of makes sense. Um, so, you know, to keep track in ICMP for uh, pings, the, uh, you know, the ICMP uh, type A code zero, I believe it is. Let's just go ahead and open up uh, the header here. In a browser, and we can see that yeah, you have types and code. So the first byte is the type, and for ICMP, eight is the value eight for echo and code, and that will be zero for echo reply. And whenever you're sending out pings, you actually need to know how to match up the responses with these, with these, with, from from the initial echo request, right? You need the echo ICMP echo reply needs to match, and how they how they do that in ICMP is with a sequence number. So the generated sequence number that must match when the request is sent out, it's a number that's generated, it's put in the payload. And then whenever the response comes back, if the numbers are the same, that's how Ping knows that they, the app, actually the Ping application knows that, that they got the right response for that particular ICMP echo request packet. But what they're doing here is they're actually adding a cryptographic uh, data to, uh, for in this case, a message authentication code, which will allow you to kind of prove that it really is. Because in some cases, someone could maybe in inject, say, uh, you know, you're worried about particular um, organizations, such as, um, well, I'm gonna use the NSA, for example, where they have high, capable, high level of capabilities, very powerful, and various, they have, they're able to, you know, interact with various important points in the routing infrastructure on the internet. Well. In this case, maybe they want to inject a, 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 the sequence number they saw and they were able to respond before the echo reply came back. And, this, and they could actually, show, and then the, the echo timing would be different. It might not be practical, but this just kind of shows you the use case for this. So what this means is that using the cryptographic function, that it's much easier to prove that the, the response is, is to match what was sent out. So that's kind of the basis for it. If you're interested to check out the, the uh, the link which has the patch, you can you can actually review the code if you're interested in further detail. Moving on. And sorry guys, I am jumping over the all over the room now. We actually have a um, I'm the only one in here at this point, Shane Sick, and this it's winding down for finals. Also, um, we have a, we're trying out a new microphone in the room, so it's in the center, and my computer is on the cable. It's not really long enough to reach the center of the room where the mic is, so I have to go back and forth between my laptop and the microphone. So if you do notice any issues with my voice, do tell me uh, if you can't hear it very well. Hopefully it picks up pretty well, even when I'm on the other side of the room. That's what I'm looking for. So do give me feedback on my voice if you could in the chat and tell me you know whether it's good or not. Next. Um, we have conference quarter. So uh, ThoughtCon's coming up. So this is related to where we are located in central Illinois, because that's in Chicago, two hours north. So do check out ThoughtCon. A few of the students are going and some of the faculty. Also, B-Side Chicago will be coming up May 16th. And one that's not mentioned there that I'll mention because I'm interested, and you guys may be too, is um, Hamvention, the world's largest ham radio uh, conference or convention. It's held in uh, around... Uh, Columbus, it's a little town outside of it, uh, and that is that same weekend that uh, it's uh, 15th through 17th, I believe. So you're interested in ham radio? I'm actually a licensed uh, technician. I haven't used it in a while. I got it a few years ago, but um, the office, it's really good. They have a huge flea market, multiple miles, so if you're actually interested in electronics, just any electronics in general, from audio to video to you know, printing your own radio station to computers and servers, People just have pallets and pallets of stuff. Like there's switches. There's I remember one year they had like three, four pallets of Cisco switches and routers. 
they're all pretty old, but you can get for like twenty dollars a piece and just something to play around with. We'll support things like VLANs and and such. So it might be just good for a home lab. But do check that out. It's actually kind of where I get some of the the NSM um, or the LUT for our Linux user group and Open NSM. It's where I get some of the equipment that we, we actually use for our services. You get it pretty cheap there. So moving on, uh, Opportunity Outpost is where we have uh, job opportunities. And Vigilant, the company that sponsored us, actually has uh, two openings right now on their team. So if you're interested in being a hunt team analyst or a senior analyst on the hunt team, do check out those links for details. We're working with various NSM technologies in uh, categorizing and escalating events and further, further uh, information is within the job description. Um, now we're going to get down to tool trade. Tool trade is where we talk about a new tool um, or how to use a particular tool each week. We have something. And Sniffy 2.0 is a tool that Shane Rogers uh, created for one of his classes. Um, he's a chair of OpenNSM with me. And unfortunately, he's not here today. He is out sick. So we're actually going to hold this off to next weekend. I'm sorry, until next Monday. And I'll we'll, we'll cover that. But without further ado, this is this ends this this uh, particular series, and now we're gonna get into the talk. So for the talk today, we have Sean. Sean developed the tool along with a few other people at uh, Marshall University called Network Scout, which we'll talk, which we'll talk about. And uh, he's given a number of uh, talks on this at various conferences, including uh, DerbyCon, AIDE 2015, and HackerCon 5. So, um, Sean, ready to take it over? Yep. Let me. Awesome. Let me go ahead and stop screen sharing, and then you'll be able to click that green button there. There you go. All right. It looks good here. All righty. Hi everyone, my name is Tom Jordan, uh, co-creator of Network Scout. Um, first off, thanks for having me. Uh, it's always fun to come talk about something you've kind of built and it's kind of like your baby. So <laughs> thanks, for, uh, <laughs> thanks for the opportunity. Uh, if you have any questions um, after the talk or during the talk, you can uh, ping us at Network Scout. Uh, we uh, it's synced to my phone, so I get all the tweets from from Network Scout, so I'll be able to reply really quick. Uh, a little bit about me: uh, I'm graduating uh, with a degree in Digital Forensics and Information Assurance from Marshall University in Huntington, West Virginia, and uh, yeah, that's essentially it. I, I do home inspections on the side. I'm a pretty typical guy, I guess. So. Uh, the other co-creator is Aiden. Uh, he wasn't able to be on the talk today, but uh, you can also message him on Twitter at RagingAsian18. So. Uh, and we have to give a shout out to our professor, Bill Gardner. He's the one who really pushed us to do this project. Uh, without him, this probably it would have never happened. And... Uh, he, he had the idea and we just took it and ran with it. So he's really the, I guess, the founder of Network Scout. And then uh, we just we just did it. So um, and we have to give out our special thanks for people who funded us because it would just be rude not to not to give them credit. So there's the Marshall University uh, Foundation, the College of Science, the Dow Chemical Company, and uh, the state of West Virginia gave us some money to build this thing. So now we're we're to the goods. The um, intro. So why build it in the first place? And we, you know, uh, like I said, Bill was really the guy. He was sitting at I think it was DerbyCon three, and they were having a conversation about you know all the exterior defenses, your firewalls, your IDSs everything on the outside, but there's really not a lot on the inside. Nothing really monitoring if you've been compromised through social engineering, things like that. And if there was, it was really expensive. So, you know, right after that, he proposed the idea to build it. 
And uh, I mean, that's uh, where it started. So there was the the need of uh, something to watch the inside and something that wasn't a couple thousand to ten thousand dollars and something that wasn't super difficult to use. And uh, we, we took that and we ran. Um, you know, what does it do? Well, it's a distributed IDS honeypot. So uh, you can launch a lot like, uh, you know, several clients. Uh, we call them Network Scout clients on various subnets and have them report back to you. Uh, you know, if you're a large corpor corporation, you can have one in accounting. You can have one in sales. And uh, you know, if someone breaks in, tries to pivot, this thing uh, would catch them. And we like to compare Network Scout to the the tsunami warning system. You throw a bunch of these, you know, buoys or clients out in your network, and hopefully it gets triggered if something's going going on that shouldn't be going on, and reports back to a central location before you know you face a compromise or or something like that. And this is kind of like the makeup. And really, this is just an additional layer of defense. Um, this isn't like in game. We solve the blue team problem. Life is happy. Uh, no, this this is just another thing, another cheap way to protect yourself and your network. So now we're going to talk about like part the part side. Um, and we got a lot of our ideas from Hackers for Charity. They're a really great nonprofit. Uh, they have a, a, a Raspberry Pi set up called Rugged Pi. It's, uh, they use it in Uganda where conditions are kind of rough and it's waterproof, dustproof, you know, modular, easy to build. And that's where we really, you know, we got the design from. Um, and the required tools, uh, we wanted to make this simple not require a lot of things. All you have to do is have a soldering iron, a drill, uh, a hammer, a plexiglass cutting tool, which you can get at Home Depot for like three dollars. Um, that's about it. I mean, there's not a lot of, of need for anything else. Um, and then here's the pieces. Uh, everything you can get on Amazon. Uh, some things we did get off uh, Radio Shack and Home Depot. Uh, the pass-throughs are actually um, used in electrical boxes. They seal wires going into uh, electrical boxes. Like I said, I'm a home inspector, so I write these things up all the time. And they kind of solve the problem of sealing that hole and keeping uh, you know, dust and water out. The fear of Radio Shack going bankrupt, we're probably going to have to update this and find some other uh, ways to get the breadboard and the standoff screws I'll have to look for an Amazon link that's not super expensive. So, um, If you ever do build one of these, um, the pins we get on Amazon, it takes like two to three weeks to get them in because they ship out of Hong Kong. So kind of, if you're going to buy anything first, start with that. And this is what it looks like when it's um, fully built. This is a B+. Plus. Um, we have an LCD screen, a shutdown button. And then we have like a power management board. And uh, the LCD screen requires, I think, three um, positive and, and four ground wires. So we were able to just build a little breadboard, handle that. And uh, hopefully if I switch this window, it'll come with me. Uh, let's see. I have a picture. Can you guys see the Raspberry Pi on? Yeah. OK. Um, so this, this is it on, um, it prints out, um, we use Dave Kennedy's uh, artillery as our IDS and honeypot client. And then we built the, you know, the reporting interface that reports it back centrally. So this um, is a client pie and it says, hey, artillery still running and the IP address. Cause we, we ran into issues with the IP address. Um, if you try to scan for, for uh, your honeypots on a network, especially if you're a large corporate network, you, you know, you don't want to go and do a, a network scan. Then also artillery kind of picks that up 
and uh, you know, you're recording threats as yourself and just to eliminate confusion, kind of make it easier on everybody, we, we just print that out on the screen. And each client um, only costs $127.74. Um, you can actually build two for roughly 210 because there's a lot of leftover parts you don't have to order. Um, so our goal was to get it under 100, 150 and uh, we were able to do that. So if you're a company, you can build like 10 of these for a thousand bucks almost. Um, that, that was a kind of the goal is to keep, keep it cost efficient. Um, and we do have a, a how-to guide available on GitHub and I'll actually take you there. Let's see. So here's our Network Scout page on uh, GitHub. It's Network Scout slash NS. There's a slide coming up with the uh, address a little bit larger. Um, tells you how to install it. But if you come over here to the wiki page, you can actually see a parts list. Um, a guide. Let's see if I can go back. There we go. And this takes, yeah. So this will actually walk you through with pictures, how to build it, how to drill the holes. That's the pass throughs, what those look like, and how we cut the plexiglass, you know, soldering the uh, power board and all that stuff. Um, and then what, what it looks like done and then how to, how to uh, install it. So that's all available on GitHub. We also have um, the LCD um, wiring it. It was already provided through uh, Adafruit. So instead of having to, you know, tell everybody how to rewire this, we just post a link here. Um, the wiring uh, schematics right there. Uh, so that's there and ready and available. You just don't have to do any of the software stuff because we. Uh, we actually built a setup script that installs everything for you. Uh, and then we also keep images up on GitHub. So you can download um, the, I, the ISO image straight um, from GitHub and uh, install it straight to the disk, plug it in. You should, our, our um, network scout should be ready to go. The only thing you'd have to change is the um, configuration file to point to your server the IP address of your server, so. Hey, uh, Sean. Yeah. How about how long does it take uh, to build? How long does it take you guys to build a, a one unit once you have all the parts? Once you have all the parts, you can build one. Um, your first one's probably going to take three to four hours. And then after okay. that, yeah, yeah. Uh, you kind of get into a groove. It, 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 you could build one and then in two hours, I think, or less. I mean, if you have everything laid out, you know, you just really, it's soldering and then drilling a couple holes and cutting plexiglass and none of that's, you know, super time intensive. So I think, I think it would be safe to say like 90 minutes, you know, one person could build one. But your first one takes longer and plexiglass, and uh, I'll kind of tell a, a, on myself a little bit. The first time we cut plexiglass, you know, we were trying to be, I mean, you know, we're, we're kind of lazy. So we're like, we'll use a Dremel. And when we start cutting plexiglass, and the, that's a horrible idea because the Dremel gets really hot and the plastic starts to melt. And it like starts, we were on a ping pong table and it starts melting into the ping pong table. And, it was just a bad experience and you get like fumes everywhere. Um, that's why you can at Home Depot, you can get this really cheap glass cutting tool and it's, it's $3 I think. And all you have to do is get a ruler and cut a straight line and then snap it. And it's really easy to do once you have it. Um, the biggest problem, uh, with, uh, with the timetables, getting those pins in. Um, like I said, it takes like three weeks to get them in, so.
Let's see, LCD instructions. And then we're also doing a training at DerbyCon. Uh, aimless plug, I guess. We'll be there building one over a two-day period, so. And we'll also be at the conference, so if you're at DerbyCon, hopefully you will be come hanging out with us. And then we go into the software side here. Um, like I said, we use uh, Trusted Sex uh, Artillery. Uh, they really made things a lot easier on us because we didn't have to build, you know, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. It was already there. Um, there's the GitHub. I'll leave that up there for a second. So um, the program layout, we have um, some files. We have our setup script, the server script. We have a client script. Then we also have uh, three other, uh, the LCD controller, which that all that does is control the LCD. You can actually, um, uh, it has its own init.d scripts. So you can um, do like service, LCD, controller, restart. If you have any issues with your screen, uh, you can stop it if you just don't want to use it. Um, same thing with the shutdown button. Um, it has its own uh, script and it runs in its own init.d. So if for some reason your button's not working, you have access to the machine, you can run it and test it. And then also we have that configuration file. And right now there's only one thing in there and that's the IP address. And what that uh, IP address is, is it points the clients to the server. Um, and then you have some folders. Uh, there's a website folder that houses the website. We have some source code. Um, some stuff we use in the startup, in the installation, and then there's also some other stuff that we put in a stuff folder. Uh, we have a MySQL table creation script in the stuff folder, which is really handy. Like I said, um, we wanted to make this super simple, so we created a, a setup script, and once you run that, if you do like website, or if you do a server pie, the website gets put in the right place, um, the tables get created. I mean, it's all one button, and I think you have to create a password for uh, your MySQL uh, service, and that's it. So we try to keep it as easy as possible. Um, well, I thought I hid the code, but well, actually, we can go look at it. And, uh, Apparently that's not the one I edited, or iCloud didn't work, so i go back to. So the server scripts um, are easy. Could you increase the font size? Yeah. This John. Is that better? Or do you need more? Uh, go, like, just a little bit more, please. Looks good, right there, yep. Let's we'll back it up. Thank you. No problem. Um, so you, what we do here is we create a server. Um, it opens up. It has a uses um, a socket, and it can listen up to four connections at once. Uh, you can change that number. We haven't played around with it too much. Um, and then we send 2024-bit uh, packets. Uh, this is all like Python standard code, so we just kind of went with what they had. Um, and it seems to work for us. All the communications are on point port 514. If you were to run into any issues, you can change that to any port um, you want to use that's not being used for something else. So, um, And then what this does, let's see, this is. It opens up the file received information. Um, creates that, writes the data, and then it sends back a message, your uh, message has been received. So this will take um, all the network scout uh, information it's getting from the servers and write it to a file and close it. And then if the file is larger than one, uh, which is just the, if it's not empty, it will uh, pass. So it, it's not gonna be writing anything else. It will open up and read the lines and, um, inject the, the message into a database called Network Scout. And then we do some, some cleanup of the code here. And that's where, right there's the injection into the um, MySQL uh, 
database. And then we commit it to the database. And if there's an error, it rolls back and it'll try again. And then we just close the connection here. And then, um, let's see, let's make sure all the data gets written. If not, it will, or if it has an error, it will pass and not write the data, else it will clean out the log file, or the received information file. So, yeah, you know, if, if we have an error, it will um, pass on the data, leave it in there. So when it goes back up and tries to go through networks, the server script again, it will say, well, the file is still larger than one, let's try to write it again. And then, you know, it will keep trying until it succeeds, and then it will clean the file. So. And there's uh, some uh, Doctor Who references. And then the website looks like this. Um, I actually, let's see. I'll send a ping out to this here from my iPhone. Do a port scan. And we'll see it actually work. So give me just one second. If you could zoom on that too when you get a chance, that'd be great. Yeah, sorry. Oh, no problem. There we yeah. go. Yeah. So I'll refresh the page here. I'm seeing that Well, give me one second. I have to turn it off to SSH and uh, let me make sure. Okay, I might have had artillery off. So, yeah, there, there we go. go. Well, didn't sacrifice enough goats to the demo gods, I guess. But uh, it worked last night. It'll, it'll print um, the IP address of the attacker. So if you're on instant response, this will kind of give you an idea of who's, you know, um, it'll do port scans. It'll do S if someone tries to brute force SSH or brute force FTP. Uh, it also monitors. Um, the certain directories inside the Pi. So if any changes happen, it'll actually say, hey, you know, we had a change in, uh, in one of your directories, you know, your Pi might be compromised. So all these messages uh, come back and uh, we actually need to put the IP address of the Pi. Or no, sorry, the attacker's right here. So the attacker IP address will show up here in the message. And this is the pi. So, you know, you know that in your system, if it's, if someone's doing a port scan, you know from what machine, and you can, you know, pull that off or put it on a virtual LAN with itself and see what they try to do. Uh, you know, it depends on what your end goal is. And then I'll put a timestamp and what happened. Um, let's see, I tried to brute force a couple times. Uh, SSH. And also, you know, part of the. Also, oh, there we go. Well, we might be able to get it now. And also, uh, when it first boots up, it'll send a message about uh, some basic security uh, configurations, like root logins, stuff like that. So, it'll kind of remind you. Hey, this is a very safe. We'll go back. Are, um, have you, have you guys, uh, are you guys like taking that data and like putting it in, into an intelligence feed or exporting it in some way? I know you could do MySQL queries for it, but I didn't know if you guys had a way to like write it to like a CSV file or you can just pull it down from the web interface or something. Um, not yet. Um, there's still a lot of, um, 
it still has a lot of growth. In fact, uh, now that I've grad or about to graduate, I'm thinking about going through the code and cleaning it up a little bit, and and maybe you know making adding some features. Um, the big thing with like a adding it to an intelligence feed or something is usually you'll, you should, or this is an internal um, monitoring, you usually get some like local IP addresses. So you're like 192.168 and you're 10.0s because um, it's meant for the inside. So your, your external IP addresses, it, unless they're getting through your firewall, which usually they're going to be using social engineering, get access you know into a computer already on your network and then pivoting it and that's what we're trying to to catch is that pivot um ah i see internal okay yeah gotcha. so um you know if we're uh if we were to build a intelligence feed or something like that it, it, it could very well um you know blo block your sales team's computer from the network or something <laughs> And that wouldn't be good. Um, we did talk with uh, some people about adding a, adding it to a, like a firewall or something, or or maybe I mean, there's a lot of things you could run with it. Um, if you know it's compromised, it'd be cool if we could integrate some kind of system where we could push to a, you know, a Cisco, you know, uh, system and say, hey, put this on a virtual LAN, maybe with a button or something. I don't even know if that's possible, but it'd be really cool because then you could monitor and kind of control things right from the you know web interface. And there's also some like security updates we want to do on the website, uh, some minor housekeeping stuff here, maybe change the timestamps to something a little bit better. But um, it's still got a lot of growing to do, I guess, as an open source platform we'll go through this code all uh, in the um oh, wait, we can just get through the this is where it reads um this is the client side so we read the um server address check the um make sure network scouts um installed and then it'll check the log file very similar to like the servers received and if the log file is less than 10 it'll submit it to the server, try, or tries to send it to the server, and then uh, if not, same thing, it won't erase it until it successfully sends it, and then it'll write the blank. Um, let's see, and it waits, so this is updating every minute, and you can change that um, based on, you know, just that one variable, and that might be something we put in the config file, file later on, but, um, Right now, you know, if, if you have a threat and it picks up on a network, a client, it will ping back to uh, to the server in less than a minute. So that's a pretty good response time. And we could even put that down, you know, 30 seconds, 10 seconds. So we want to make, uh, you know, kind of give it enough time where you're not sending a bunch of stuff to the server and, and uh, pretty much uh, dosing your own server. So, um, and then this is just the connection we like to put in there because it's it's just a simple script to connect to a server. And if you want to, you know, if you ever do an open source project and you know need to pull some code connecting to a server, right there, it's really simple. Just whatever you want to send, do the file open, change that log path, and you can send whatever you want. Uh, Go over some challenges. Um, Python was a big challenge for us because neither one of us were really good at it. And I, I hadn't even touched Python until I started Network Scout. So um, one of the late ways I learned uh, how to code in Python was to look at artillery and kind of dissect it. And then you know, kind of figured out the, the syntax and what different things did. And then I was able to run with it. So. It was pretty neat, um, and if any of my coding is really horrible, you can you can blame uh, Dave Kennedy, I guess, because <laughs> he essentially taught me how to code in Python. So um, the IP address we already talked about. We also had an issue with shutdown. So when you launch artillery, 
SSH gets blocked. So if you're trying to SSH into your Pi to shut it down for maintenance or if you need to, you know, fix something on the Pi, you're, uh, you're not going to be able to. So we installed a button. It was like a, I think it's like five lines of code. And whenever you push the button, it senses the voltage change, shuts down the Pi. Um, so it was a really, you know, kind of elegant and simple solution and making sure you don't brick your SD card. Um, another thing is when we started with artillery, we didn't have the logging function function available. Um, it said it was there, but then if you tried to use it, it would crash artillery. So um, this kind of inspired some creativity. Um, what we ended up doing is there is a uh, line in artillery called warn the, warn the good guys, and that it creates like a message. So what I did is, uh, you know, I grabbed the IP address, uh, created my own log uh, inside artillery. So it creates its own directory for a log and then creates a logs.txt file. And then it'll add things to the log as they come in uh, from artillery. And then I took uh, this function on the left, or no, sorry, function, yeah, function on the left. It goes through artillery, looks for, you know, that warn the good guys and injects um, our code into artillery to where it will write the function for us. So um, when you install a client, actually downloads artillery, or well, it tells, you, it tells you to download artillery. And then our um, setup script scans through artillery, finds the warn the good guys, and injects the NS log warning uh, script. So we're actually creating our own logs because that function wasn't working um, when we started using artillery. And they might have fixed it. They've actually, uh, I was looking at artillery last night and they've really cleaned up the code. So it might work now and we might not need it anymore. But it was um, one of those things we spent a week trying to figure out how to do it. And eventually, uh, through a lot of Googling and a lot of tears, we, uh, we were able to mod modify Dave's code to get or trusted sex code to get the log files to write. And then we could use Network Scout to send the log files over. Let's see. And then we ran into, um, you know, we had to find a way to set up the server. And that's a, another thing. Apparently, LAMP's not the safest or most secure um, way to install a server on Pi. So we're, we're pondering if we should change to something else. Um, but for now it, it works and, uh, you know, you're not storing anything financially viable on a pie, hopefully, or any, anything dangerous, but eventually we do want to move it over to something maybe a little bit more updated. Uh, so that's what we use today. So, um, uh, like I said, the setup was really hard. How can we make it easier? And uh, Jess Bohr actually wrote uh, on GitHub a script to install LAMP automatically, so you don't even have to uh, you know, download it yourself. And with this script, um, we were able to completely automate almost the whole uh, server setup, you know, with the exception of, uh, like I said, setting up your MySQL password. So it made things really smooth. And this is what it kind of looks like. Um, when you launch the setup, you have four op or four options. You can uninstall artillery, do the server or the client, and then you can exit. Um, and then it'll install. This is the um, client. It installs Network Scout, moves it to its own file in the, the var folder under the root. Um, it updates the GPIO, which is your uh, Pins used for the LCD screen, the shutdown. So we make sure that that library is up to date. Um, then you can see here we uh, modify artillery. We uh, open the source code and put in our uh, our logging function right into the bottom of the source code or their uh, core dot pi where they pull all their functions. And then we go through and inject the the calls to the function. And then um, we create all our directories, our files, and all that stuff. And then um, we, we ran into some issues with the, 
you know, the, the edit.d scripts to start. And um, I spent a day and it was so frustrating. And then I came back in the morning, I realized it was just permissions on the files. So <laughs> sometimes when you're coding, you get really stressed out and you come back the next morning and you realize it was just some simple little thing that you just didn't see the next day. Um, but what this does, it lets you, you know, reboot the system. Um, so if you're working, you know, if you just a uh, configuration file in uh, the server or the client, you can just uh, service NS client restart and it'll restart the program with the new configs. Um, and that's the um, changing the permissions. And then it was a similar thing for the um, uh, server. I'm not going to go through all this, but it just installs LAMP. Um, puts the, you know, moves all the Autofruit library into the Python library and then moves your website over. And then um, we execute um, the MySQL creator uh, dot pi function, which installs all those uh, MySQL database type things um, when you use it with your website. So we're able to, you don't even have to touch MySQL. It'll do all that for you and then it'll tell you the website. Um, and then this just uninstalls it, removes everything and purges MySQL and LAMP and all that. Uh, let's see. So this is what a setup looks like. You just download it from GitHub on your Raspberry Pi, and then that's what the options look like. So like I said, we try to keep it really simple. You set up one server, then you can set up as many clients as you want, uh, depending on you know how much you want to, or how many you want to throw out uh, and watch your net, or you know, to monitor your network. Um, and then this is, um, on every client, you have to point the config file to the server. So you just, you know, nano or buy or, uh, any of those text editors in uh, your console bar network scout config. This is what it looks like. And you just change that IP address. So yeah, again, we tried to keep it really simple, nothing too complicated. And then this is the tack. Uh, let's get through. I did a port scan with my Mac and then you can actually pick how many ports you want open for it to like emulate. Uh, one of the things we might, uh, I thought about doing is put, um, kind of like a list of ports and then randomize your pies. So they don't all look the same. So you might have one with a, you know, your common services and then some other random ones and then kind of like shuffling it. So if you have a network with, you know, 10, um, clients on it, network scout clients, they all aren't identical. Just to kind of blend in a little bit better. And then the future, like I said, we have some touch ups to do some security stuff. You know, we're looking at the different servers. Um, one of the big things I want to do is um, to run on Debian and some other things. Um, like I said, when we, when we built this, we didn't have a lot of Python experience. Um, so like the directories are kind of set in concrete. Um, I need to change that to where, you know, install the server on a Debian build virtualized and, and then you can have the Raspberry Pi stock back and reduce the cost even more. Um, and somebody asked about doing it on Windows. So that might be in the future too, but there's, a um, you know, there's a lot of things uh, we can do with it. Another thing is, you know, we put it on GitHub. It's open source. We're kind of hoping people will take it and run with it and do things we didn't even think of. We had some people come and want to make it kind of close source and use it for network monitoring. And we were just like, you know, that's, that's not why we built it. And so we got a grant for it. So we didn't know how that would all work out, but um, let's see. Any questions? Um, anything I can show you guys? Um, I'm going to go ahead and say that if anybody has a question and that they are remote, uh, you can unmute your microphone 
ask the question and then mute your microphone again. So I'll start with the question. Um, is do you know if anybody is going to be taking this project up after you after you're uh, graduated, or is it just going to be kind of you and your free time later? Um, well, Bill wants to do some more things. Uh, he's had some ideas, and he might branch it, um, or he might take it. No, nope. branch it. Oh, there's nope. Bill. Oh. No, it's Sean's project. Uh, he this was originally my idea. That I, I never had the time to execute it, so Sean and Aiden were the two people who took it and I actually did something with it. And, and it's it's too far along for me to step back in and say, okay, guys, now that you've done all the hard work. Um, and really, it's Sean and Aiden's pro project at this time. Of course, it's open source. We want people to contribute. I might tr contribute to it, but um, I seriously doubt that I'll be doing anything more than that. Okay. Um, so Sean, got another question. Um, do you, is this deployed anywhere that you know of, like maybe at one of your sponsors, such as Dow? You know, uh, when we went, um, I don't know for sure, but I know um, it, when we uh, have it deployed in two places. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, I have it. Uh, I gave it. I've been deploying it for my uh, work uh, my free time during the summertime I've actually rolled these out in two law firms they're in limit they're in testing still and it's still limited um, we probably need to update those this summer uh, but yeah you know, I have sort of secretly started deploying these things to see if we could break them hey, okay and, oh, sorry and when we did research um, we had some Dell our Dell representatives um, kind of like looking at all the projects and stuff and I talked to one guy and he was like He thought it was the best. I mean he, he was really excited about it. So I don't know if he took it and Did anything but I mean his level of excitement was kind of off the charts so <laughs> uh, Maybe he did or maybe they're looking at using it. I, I really don't know and then we also when we present at DerbyCon uh, the University of Syracuse was going to take it and you know, kind of play around with it in one of their virtual labs or something. So I think people are using it, um, but we just don't know. Don't really keep track, and no one's really asking questions yet. So maybe it's all, maybe it's working. So <laughs> maybe there's no issues or anything. So cool. Well, anyways, if if uh, anyone else has any questions and they don't want to unmute their mic, you can also um, add it to the chat, and I can read them. So, if you do have questions, do speak up. Have you done any performance testing on on this at all? Like, I don't. I've never used a Raspberry Pi. I don't know, like. You know how many connections it can handle or activate or anything. I'm just curious if you guys did any like real world um, like SSH brute force tests. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it'd be fine for most well, things. The thing about when we went with Network Pi with uh, Raspberry Pi is that you should never see traffic on this. And if you do, you've got an issue. Um, right, right. And and yes, you know, well, we've done testing in my own lab. Uh, and it's also uh, said deploying two places and testing and and uh, we tested with what it just basically bans you if you're trying to brute force okay. it. and and uh, Sean was talking about it will uh, some of you have issues with SSH you have to remember to set up whitelisting on uh, that's some of the things we need to look at automating is whitelisting um, and you need to whitelist whatever your computer you're going to manage the uh, the, the Raspberry Pi's network with or the uh, you know the whole idea is this thing's distributed you put it on physical or uh, beach VLAN in your network and that just sits there and listens but typically you shouldn't have to run gigs and gigs through this thing because it's not ever it's sort of like I think uh, 
Sean, I don't know if you use the example of the tsunami warning, but if it, if you actually see something, you've got a problem. Uh, so it's mm -hmm. sort of like think of it as like a smoke detector. Uh, yeah, there are false positives, but you know it may be a, it may be a fire, maybe somebody burns some popcorn. Um, right, right. I, I was. I guess my question was just more of like a general platform one. But yeah, you're right. I, I can see how for you, you wouldn't really need to worry about a performance like that. Uh, now, on, on the other side of this, and sorry to step on you just for a second, we actually were looking at applying for um, a, a, a cyber, um, cyber infrastructure grant to build network scouts that would monitor uh, networks, uh, high speed like internet two networks. Uh, if we, of course, we would have to abandon Raspberry Pis if we did that, but it, right. we didn't get the grant, and uh, so therefore it's on the shelf right now. Plus, right, we cool. haven't really hit, um, you know, where the the Pi or Raspberry Pi two just came out. Haven't really uh, had an opportunity to play with it, but it's like uh, it's got some horsepower to it for thirty five bucks, you know. Um, 900 uh, megahertz quad core processor <laughs> runs Windows 10. So, you know, and for the same price as a, a B plus, that, that should be ample, but we haven't done any actual like tests on the Raspberry Pis themselves to kind of conclude the question. So. Okay. Well, if we do not have any more questions, we can wrap it up. So do uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. And you'll be doing uh, Raspberry, or you'll be doing Network Scout training at DerbyCon, is that correct? Yes. We will be there. Um, our training's Wednesday and Thursday. So we'll be there Tuesday night till Sunday. So, so yeah, if anybody wants uh, training, in a professional setting, do check out DerbyCon and sign up for their session, and they can teach you, they can instruct you on building and applying this this tool. Because you get to build your own network scout and take it home with you. Yep. It's your very cool, very cool. Yeah, this is a this is a very neat tool. I'm glad you guys came out with this. This is it definitely inspires I think others to look at small form factor devices to to you know apply NSM concepts to them so they can be you know put put throughout small networks and such, mm -hmm. or, or even large networks of course. So I yeah, do um, definitely definitely a thumbs up for you guys for this for implementing this. Well, we also realize not everyone has a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> As somebody who spent 20 years as a network administrator and a network defender, I can attest for the fact that a lot of people don't have a lot of money. So that was really what the target was is, uh, for those people. Perfect, perfect. All right, well, we're going to wrap up here. I want to thank you for coming out, Sean. And everybody, do check out the GitHub link that's in his notes and also on our meeting notes on the that were in the email. Um, and thanks for joining the call, Bill. And no problem. next week, I, I believe. Oh, no problem. No problem at all. Uh, next week will be the last uh, open NSM meeting for this semester. We will have Adam, who is leading the malware team, the malware analysis team at Malwarebytes. He'll be talking about patching uh, malware and uh, binaries with various tools such as IDA and I imagine Ollie Debug, et cetera. So do check that out. Also, if you're interested in sponsoring us, go to uh, gofundme.com slash openNSM. Check out the website. We have a lot of things in store for next semester. Over the summer, I'll be working on the website, planning research, and getting our laboratory up, our Gennetti cluster specifically up and running. So um, until then, uh, take care, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you.